Welcome to the Writer Talks. I'm wondering if Happy Halloween is an apt greeting. Instead, maybe it should be Hey Halloween Horror. What do you say? Now, how about the horrors of the human mind? The horrors that a human mind can unleash in the garb of love, friendship, kinship, or leadership surpasses all conceivable horrors. This is one of the aspects I have focused in my debut novel, It Must Have Been Love But, which was published just a few days back. The capricious nature of the human mind and emotions is not only hard to comprehend, but daunting to face or to overcome. I'm taking this opportunity to do a short book reading of my contemporary romance. Given how perceptive she is, she invariably sensed my emotions. I did not bring you up as a weakling. You have your entire life before you, and I do not know how long your papa will be around either, but you need to care for him too, until then. Picture, I am only worried about your PhD. If ever there was a ludicrous descent, this had to be it. We laughed, my mom weakly and I in sadness. I will study for my PhD, mom. I have promised you, and you know I'm very good at keeping up my word. Oh, you'd better, else I'd be worried from up there too. Maybe that will ensure you go nowhere and be here safe and strong with us. Stop making excuses and start studying. What is happening with your novel? These things need to be done regularly. Pikshu, be more disciplined, she asserted in a characteristic way. I could hear the old ring in her voice. Papa walked in laughing. This is the urgent talk you wanted to have with her? I thought you would finally ask her to. No, coax her to marry. I could picture mom giving him an exasperated stare while sporting a half smile. All three of us pictured one another and laughed. This is us, always being us. Papa continued to talk. Since the mobile was on the speakerphone mode, I knew he was braiding my mom's lovely long tresses. This pestilence of the lung had not sullied her fair complexion, her sharp features, the long nose, her graceful appearance, except that she could no longer wear her perfectly ironed sides. Given her dangerously low weight, she unwillingly wore the dressing gowns but had resolutely insisted on remaining at home in her final days. A few more minutes of banter, Papa thought he was being discreet by talking about her health from the garden, and I reminded him that he was standing by the windows of her room. We finally concluded the conversation, cheering each other up, both equally worried as to what life would be like without the captain of our ship. I sat staring at the phone, my mind going blank at times, then returning awash with memories. Multiple memories. Another ring, and I continued looking at the phone unmoved. Another message, a repeat. A picture, is everything all right? Why are you not answering my call? I saw her text, sensed the urgency, her anxiety, and called her back. She sounded disturbed. Her hello was followed by the questions she had sent in her text as well. I am okay, mysterious Maya. Don't worry. I loved your kid. Thank you so much for that. I'm truly touched. Moreover, you made it for me and came all the way to hand it to me. She's a nice person, I told myself, and kicked my intuition aside. Don't scare me like that. Why did you not answer the phone? I couldn't, as I was staring at it and was just thinking what to do, I confessed. Displaying her habitual wit and comfort she has with me, she replied in Hindi. Genius, when the phone rings, lesser mortals like us answer it, not stare at it and think. This is one of the things I love about her. Her quick wit, fluency in Hindi. Actually, she's a polyglot. Why are you so serious? What happened? All good at home? Did I offend you? I am so sorry. She was almost in tears and she often apologized for trifles. Recovering instantaneously, I too responded. Lady Maya, kindly pause and permit the person at the other end of the line to speak. Not until many months later did I realize this was her trait. At crucial moments, she would neither listen nor let you speak. I look forward to your comments on that. Now, joining me all the way on the Writer Talks is another romance specialist all the way from California, Jennifer Irwin. Incidentally, her second novel, Address the Color of the Moon, is being published today, her second book in the tri-series of Sky, Moon and Sun.
Her debut novel, Address the Color of the Sky, published in 2017, garnered rave reviews and won her seven book awards. Jennifer, through her protagonist, Prudence Aldrich, explores her inner demons that propel her to frequent self-destructive behavior that she grapples with and tries to overcome at Serenity Hills Rehab Center. In her second book, being published today, Address the Color of the Moon, Jennifer tracks the rocky and sometimes disastrous path of recovery. A recovery that will require prudence and her friends to face down the demons of their past while learning to accept the fearful uncertainty that comes with living life on your own two feet. So let's dive in and listen to the fascinating aspects of Jennifer's writing and her experiences. But before that, my dear subscribers, do get more people on board so that we can continue to engage with brilliant writers from across the world. Please do like, share and subscribe to The Writer Talks. I do hope you enjoy watching me talk to the vibrant Jennifer Irwin. Ensure the tricks and treats are for Halloween alone and desist from toying with another's life and emotions. Until next time, stay inspired, believe in yourself, pursue that dream and smile. Of course, don't forget to pick up a copy of my novel as well as of Jennifer's. Until next time, ahoy! Ahoy! Welcome to the Writer Talks. Joining me all the way from California is Jennifer Irwin. Ahoy, Jennifer. Hi, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be on your show. I'm delighted to have you here. And uh, how are you feeling awaiting the release of a color of the address, the color of the moon, barely a few days away? Yeah, I'm. I'm absolutely. Um, thrilled with the advance reviews that came in as a lot came in today and I'm very excited by how it's been received by my advanced readers thus far um, and I'm, I'm I think my readers are really excited for it to come out and I've sold a lot of advanced copies so I'm hoping to hit, hit, hit a nice number on Amazon the first week I'm Absolutely. really hoping to get to, to sell a lot of copies and I like to, to, to get the indie published world in, in the ring with the other big guys. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. it's, it's such, a, it's such yeah. an admixture of feelings, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm very excited. And I'm absolutely I'm honored to have an opportunity to write the story and that people want to read this book and that people have been excited to... I'm anticipating my fans that read the first one, and it just means so much to me. And and um, and I thus far I haven't disappointed them according to the reviews that have been posted. So just, I'm very excited. Yeah, totally. We will continue to talk about your sequel and your writing process, besides a host of other things. Uh, but first, let's dive into the rapid response section. I'm, I'm sure you know the drill. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> Great. Okay. So here's the first question. Between writing a novel and waiting for it to be published, which do you think is more nerve-wracking? Uh, waiting for it to be published. Right. Because, because, yeah. because of all the mediate yeah. feelings. And yeah. Just, uh, I, I love writing. I don't find writing to be nerve-wracking. I find it to be very pleasurable and um, very calming. and. If I could do it all day, every day, I would. If I didn't have to eat and like work and support my family, but I, um, I, the publishing is out of your hands. You have no control over it, and right. um, it's it's just a very and and you don't know how what they're looking for, and that publishers have a certain mission and a, an idea of what they need to fill right now, and you may not be in that right spot. Or if you don't have the right connections, even if you have an agent, there's just so many things like that you don't have control over. I don't like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, if it was entirely up to you, what is that one stereotype about romance that you would like to break or debunk? Um, I'd like to see more romance where everybody's not perfect and the guys don't have like perfect bodies. And I'd like to see more flawed. Um, people and I'd also like to see 
the guys going after the girls and the girls not wanting the guys or um, more same sex and transgenders and just different different types of relationships that are a little not what you would typically see in a, in a romance novel. Um, but I guess more flawed, more flaws, people that, that aren't perfect. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think flawed characters work better than these uh, perfect. I love, I, I'm, all, I'm all about the flawed, the flawed <laughs> protagonist. Right. Now, if you had the option to choose between your book being a Pulitzer Prize winner or a bestseller, what would your choice be and why? 100% Pulitzer Prize. Um, I, I am one of those people, when my um, debut won seven book awards, the first awards I got were, or received were, I was in a restaurant and scanning my emails. I I wanted to just stand up on the table and because to me it was really exciting to have my work compared in a genre with other writers and when it was the best feeling I've ever had it was validation that I'm doing something right and I didn't know then that I was going to win seven awards not just the, the first three but to win a Pulitzer Prize would just it's it's just the pinnacle of of being a writer and that you've told a universal story and you've done it in a, in a way that just speaks to all nationalities. I mean, it just would be such an incredible uh, feeling for me to win that. I mean, being a bestseller is just really about marketing and sales and winning a Pulitzer prize is about being a great writer. And that's what I want to do. And that's what I want to be known for. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, if you had the chance to meet either Ernest Hemingway or Sidney Sheldon, whom would you prefer to meet? And what is that one thing you'd like to ask? Um, definitely Ernest Hemingway. And I would ask him if he'd be my best friend. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Just be my writing buddy. <laughs> Hang out with me. <laughs> Have a, have a cocktail and, and talk writing. I just want to hang out with them and just watch the process. And I know he was kind of a train wreck, but I'm kind of a train wreck too. So I feel like we would get along. And I've been told I write, write like him and have a similar writing style. So um, I just, I don't know. I feel a bond with him in a, in a, in a, in a weird way. Right. Ever since Fair enough. Telling me. I've always loved his books, but. Um, yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Now, if you were given the choice, would you rather be a publisher or an editor? A publisher by a long shot. <laughs> I, I think I mentioned to you in the pre-show. I, I don't like editing. I'm not. I'm definitely not the grammar police. Don't shoot me for saying that. Um, that's what good editors are for. Uh, if I could control the publishing industry or what books got published, I would. I would just love to do that because I would really change a lot of what I, what, what is being put out. Um, right. I would, I would pick up more obscure stories and, and look for stories that have a lot of heart and universal, um, just underlying everything's not as it seems and we're all struggling and still, um, relatable characters yet flawed. And I would just try and give more people chances. And if I could be a publisher, that would be a really great feeling. Amen to that. I, I really hope and pray that you get to be a publisher. <laughs> <laughs> the All right. Now on a lighter way, uh, do you run on the beach or fire away at the tennis courts when you're angry or frustrated? Uh, definitely. I get on my spin bike and do a spin class. I used to uh -huh. run on the beach, but my knees don't like running anymore. So, um, but I'm definitely wanting to get in some good cardio and sweat and just forget about my problems. And I actually exercise every day because it's how I uh, control my emotional health and de-stress. And I'm just a much happier, nicer person when I've gotten in that exercise. So when I hit a tennis ball, it usually goes in the wrong area. Out. <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't want to have a third cut. <laughs> All right. Now, between the moon and the sky, which one do you gaze at more fondly? Um, I would say I would say the sky with the first book, and now I gaze at the moon. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow that's 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 great that's amazingly done <laughs> fair enough thank you for being such a such a sport <laughs> now a sequel to this highly popular and award winning novel dress the color of the sky is ready and it's all set to hit the market on 30th october what is uppermost in your mind um i was not able to advertising with my first book on Amazon because the cover um was designed by a film producer who had opted the film rights to my book and the girl was holding the dress up and it really stopped me from penetrating the market um mm -hmm. so I've been taking classes on Amazon advertising and how you run ads and manage your ads um it's very complicated and algorithms and it's 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 so dry I die when I take these classes but I now have a new cover on my first book. I have a, a very similar sort of cohesive cover on the second one. And I'm hoping now that I uh, will be learned, uh, completely educated on how you run Amazon ads. And now I can run them, that I will be able to manage that and really penetrate the market and stay in the top 100 in at least one category at all times. Um, and that's really the trick. So, um, just keep the momentum and, and don't stop. Just you can't let your eye off the ball when you're doing these marketing. It's it's incredible. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I love your learning. determination. So you you're you're yeah. learning to advertise as well. And that, that that's not easy for writers because we have it, it's it's yeah. fine as long as it is creative. But as you're saying it's, it's, a, it's a hustle. It's a yeah, it's a yeah. real hustle. And I use my social media very, very um, diligently to promote my writing and I found that my followers want to know about me as a person. So I, I share a lot of personal things and as a result, I've grown my social media and now I have, um, I'm an ambassador for Rent the Runway, by far the oldest one they've ever um, brought on to the ambassador team. And so I'm getting um, fabulous clothing and um, I get to wear my social media posts and um, it's really an honor to be part of that but that was just something that happened because I'm doing this side hustle of just really helping promote me as a writer and my work on social media um, but I think that this is the way of the new writer the, the writer today has to wear many hats and um, but they, even if you publish big five they're not sending you out on book tour they're not going to spend a lot of money on you unless you're a really big writer so you really have to do it on your own and you have to get out there and hustle Right. And I know a lot of writers are, are, are very introverted and uncomfortable doing that kind of thing, but I just put myself out there. So but that's that's fair enough because you you put your blood and sweat into writing, and then you would yeah. want people to know about that. I want people to read it. I want people to to, to get to know my writing and to become a fan of my writing, and eagerly await the next book after this one. So right. excited. Yeah. All the, all the best to that. All the best to that then. And uh, <laughs> when and how did you come up with this sequel? Okay, so I, I at first I wasn't entirely sure, but I did leave the end hanging with the first book. Um, Prudence Aldrich is a sex addict. She'd been in rehab for five weeks, um, dealing with facing the traumas of her childhood. And my readers were just after me for a sequel. I want to know how Prue is going to fare in the world with all her new skills after five weeks, is she going to stay with Nick? Is she going to, she kisses somebody in, in rehab and what's going to happen with that? Will there be a romance? Um, and I, I wrote the book pretty quickly. Um, and my agent helped me a lot. Um, and he did try to get the book picked up, but it, like I said, it's very difficult to get a sequel picked up. That's been published when the first book was published in the, and I was actually with my future daughter-in-law wedding dress shopping and her mom is a huge fan of mine. I'd never met her. And she said, 
he was obviously there fighting dress shopping and she said when when are you going to release the next book you have to do it and i thought to myself she's right i need to get this book out so i told my agent stop pitching the book i just want to release it and um and and just do it and i pushed this timeline very quickly with releasing the book um right. so it's like lighting a really big fire really really quickly and trying to get a lot of people excited so um i really appreciate you having me on your show um just so i can continue to um get the word out about this about this book so right. i'm excited now how did you come up with these two uh titles they're rather rather poetic isn't it uh address yeah. the color of the sky address the color of the moon how, how did you come up with these titles <laughs> So um in in the book there's I refer to this fairy tale um called Donkey Skin it's a very old fairy tale um and there actually been some movies made on it many many you know years ago but um and in the book it, the student's Aldrich has been um sexually assaulted and she's trying to heal these wounds from her childhood and in the fairy tale Donkey Skin um the king's wife the queen is on her deathbed and tells the king what well, after i die you can only marry someone fairer than me and in the king's madness after his wife passes away he thinks his daughter is the fairest of them all and of course she does not want to marry her dad um and that just really tied then to what happened to prudence aldrich in her childhood and the things that i deal with in the book um and so she goes to a fairy like a nymph and says my father wants to marry me i don't want to marry him what should i do and and the fairy says have him make you a dress the color of the sky he'll never be able to do it and then you'll be free so of course the king makes this beautiful dress with jewels and you know it's perfect it looks just like the sky so she goes back to the fairy and what should i do he made the dress now what and have him make you a dress the color of the moon he'll surely never be able to do that so that's why i came up with the title So there's three dresses that the fairy tells the princess to to have her father make and the next one is a dress the color of the sun so okay. if i did do a trilogy that would be the title of the third book because i love right. the end of this one a little bit hanging as well <laughs> so, <laughs> all yeah. right oh yeah so now i have an inkling as to what's in the offing what's coming <laughs> right so the next yeah. one would be yeah. about the sun <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, I I loved and uh, the highly engrossing offbeat topic that you chose for your female uh, protagonist, Prudence Aldrich, um, sex addiction. Not not something mm-hmm. that anybody would uh, pick up for a female protagonist. Now, what led you to focus right. on this? Um, well, I think just kind of what you said is that it is really unusual and not likely. Um, men are typically rewarded for having a lot of sexual partners, and it's like. There, it's not a problem but when a woman has a lot of sexual partners it's a problem and she's a slut or she's you know loose and um from the research that I was doing for the book um and trying to really understand when somebody is sexually assaulted um as a child how that damages their sexuality and their idea of relationships and self love and um I had um very traumatic experiences as a child and i realized that there's a disassociation between sex and love because you hadn't understood how that worked as a kid being having being sexually assaulted so um i did a lot of research and understood that when there were all these men coming out as sexual um addicts but you rarely heard about a woman in in the media and hollywood and all that sort of you know a, a man's big excuse is when he's being accused of of attacking all his women or being inappropriate oh i have a problem with sex addict so i thought well, what if a woman's a sex addict what if um you hmm. she she has a problem because of what happened to her in her childhood and so um prudence is basically her journey is to find self love and um a lot of us don't have self love because of experiences that we've had as children and and I really wanted to have this book bring hope to a lot of people that you can heal and you can move forward um have healthy relationships but the first relationship you have to have is one with yourself 
Right, absolutely. Yeah, bonding with oneself and self love is so so crucial. Otherwise, you uh, yeah ending ending with one problem from moving from one problem to another. Right. Yeah, and no. and we're all very hard on ourselves. You know, we have these little absolutely. voices calling us, and I deal with all that in the book. And I actually um, healed a lot. Um, while I was writing the book and many, many, many readers have reached out to me telling me how much the story helped them and changed them. And you're right. Made, and made, yeah. Yeah. Right, writing and reading invariably is cathartic. I, I think that's, that's the most mm-hmm. beautiful thing about, about it. Now, regardless of all the talk we have over uh, women's liberation, female empowerment and all that, uh, societal acceptance still relies on uh, women essaying these typical roles to perfection, that of a daughter, mm-hmm. wife, mother. Now, in your sequel, you're exploring this highly flawed protagonist. Were you apprehensive at any point in time about having such a flawed protagonist? I was, um, and the way that I laid the book out, because um, the first book opens and she's having sex on an airplane bathroom on her way to rehab, and she just couldn't care less about this guy, and then she hits on the driver, and so she's a little hateful and not likable, and right out of the gate. The way, um, when I wrote the book, I tried several different ways, writing it in timeline format, which didn't really work, um, so what I do is I go back and forth in time. And you see this young child, this young girl fighting for her life. And she's strong and, and resilient and, and has a lot of terrible experiences. But for every bad experience, there's some kindness that's helping to soften her rough edges. Um, so being a, writing it back and forth in time, I take this highly flawed, poorly behaved protagonist you might not even like out of the gates. And you root for her you you genuinely care for her and you want her to make it and people just tell me that they just care about prudence and they they're like come on and when she makes a bad decision they're like no you you can do better you know they just really because i made it so that when i wrote the back and forth in time it creates a sense of what she's been through and you just go oh you know i want her to make it now i get it i see why she is the way she is um, and so I think to answer your question, I was scared. I also think it's a difficult subject to talk about being sexually assaulted, to write about it, to not turn off your readers, to make it clear what she's endured without graphically getting, you know, to, to explain it without explaining it. So that was very hard to do. Um, and I was very careful with how I wrote that and how I, I put so that you know what's going to, what's happened to her without really graphically because nobody wants to read about that and it's a terrible subject but what i've learned is that so many people have experienced trauma in their childhood so so many and it is an unspoken thing and people just don't talk about it um and i'm glad that people have shared with me how much the book has helped them um and i try to do it in a light way and i write very matter of fact and very um easy to read and sort of funny and um, I try to just keep it as light as possible for a heavy, pretty heavy subject. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, could I request you to please read uh, your favorite section from the book? Um, I wasn't really, <laughs> I don't know if it's my favorite section. I just flipped to a page. Um, sure. What, how long did you want me to read? What, just a couple paragraphs or? Yeah, uh, j- uh, about a minute and a half. Okay, I'll just read. I'll just read. Um, it's chapter 18, Proof Present. Since the incident with Binky, I obsessed over all the times I had let Lily down. The first summer we spent together, I stopped the spinnaker wrong for the end of the season regatta. He had instructed me, but somehow I still screwed up. I couldn't wrap my arms around messing up on something so important to Lily. Had I done it on purpose? I sabotaged friendships with the people I loved most. We all held the dark side, but mine erred on the side of evil. Throughout middle school, Lily was teased for being skinny. And a mean pack of girls, popular girls, became relentless with their teasing, and I was too weak to defend my friend. When the crew included me in a movie night, I accepted. It was the ultimate betrayal. They had invited me to make her feel bad, and I didn't care. I, ca- I craved the in-crowd 
and I shit talked her behind her back to pump myself up. I remember Lori asking me about it in the locker room at the, at the sound club. Did you tell Carolyn, Carolyn that I didn't need a training bra and call my boobs mosquito bites? Lily stepped out of the rolled up swimsuit and wrapped herself in a towel. I wedged myself in the corner of the tiny dressing room, my suit dripping on the concrete beneath my feet. I remember how tightly I gripped my ponytail to wring it out. What? I feigned disbelief. I never said that. I wrung out my hair, hoping I could wring out the fear of my lie coming to light, along with the excess water and the envy of her life being infinitely better than mine. Beautiful. Love that. It's beautiful. So beautiful. There, there's a lot, there's a friendship in this book. Um, and then I introduced the friendship in book one. And I'm very fascinated by female friendships so they can be the most rewarding and fulfilling and amazing things. And mm -hmm. women really need to share and need to have friends to feel their place in, in the world. It just gives them a sense of hope and belonging. And the friendships can be so painful, too. And I put this friendship to the test in this book. I really put it to the test. And um, why Lily is so loyal to Prudence. Prudence right. says the unthinkable to Lily in the book. And I get down to why Lily is there for Prudence through thick and thin. There's a very good reason. And um, I reveal that. And it's, it's a beautiful friendship and um, a complex friendship like most girlfriends. And there's a little bit of jealousy. And I think that well, there's a tiny bit of envy in all of us at times. And then there's at other times we're really overjoyed for our friends when they're doing better than us. So we're only human. I really dig into the human side of, of relationship. Absolutely. And, and, and you're right when you're talking about uh, friendships being complex and particularly with women because there, there, is, there is this fine line, as you said, with jealousy mm -hmm. uh, and inkling of competition. But at the same time, there is this deep emotional connect as well. And uh, yeah, and that fulfillment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we, need, we need friendships. We really, I mean, it's just so critical. And I, I, a couple of reviews that have come in have just said they're so happy. But I brought Lily and elaborated more about Lily because she was a very favorite character in the first book. But you don't really know what her story is. So um, you really get to know Lily in this book. Right. Now, I yeah. noticed that uh, uh, Prudence, um, in her case, it's quite an ironic name. Uh, more curiously. <laughs> <laughs> How curiously now, uh, in, in, in your first book, I read that um, you, you referred to Prudence as your alter ego. Would you like to uh, elaborate on that? She's, um, Prudence is cooler than me. Um, I think you know, she's an interior designer. She has better style and is... Um, She's, she's kind of a badass, and I, I wish I was as cool as, as Prudence, but I, I very much relate to her as a woman, and I relate to her flaws, and um, I, I, I just found her to be somebody that was a part of me, but at the same time as I developed her character, I pulled her away to not be me, because a, a lot of the first book is based on my life, the, the childhood parts, and um, to not make it my memoir, and to not have it be me, I had to create this character that was bigger than me. Um, so that's why I say she's my alter ego, because she's, she's who I, I, I guess I would want to be if I had um, just a bigger personality and had more guts. And I mean, she's just very... She's a very interesting character and um, and very relatable, um, but she's talented and, and I don't know, she's just funny the way she thinks about other people and, and I, you kind of get into her head and I just wish that I could have a lot of the, her qualities. I, I admire her a lot. That's lovely. Yeah. Now, speaking of the cover, it is um, minimalist, elegant. How involved were you uh, involved in this cover design? 
So the cover um, was a very important part of the book to me because I was not involved in the original cover of my first book. I had a film deal on it and the film producer designed it. Um, and um, the, the first cover caused me a lot of problems. I couldn't advertise on Amazon. Um, because she wasn't wearing the dress, it caught, it just it um, it also made the book look like a romance novel. It made the book look um, kind of like it was just going to be a really quick light read, um, and it's not. So I changed the first cover um, to be very minimalist, and I wanted to do something very similar, um, but not really tell you too much about the story. So I had um, an artist who is in Australia. She's very talented. Her art's very clean and gentle and soothing. Um, and I actually had, well, I'll show you the cover. I had a friend who does marketing. And originally the moon, I think, was right over her head. And my uh -huh. best friend, my, my closest friend here in L.A. said, you need to move the moon over. And that was like, that was it. So, um, yeah, it's very simple and clean, and um, I just, I, I, it's, it's interesting, C covers that you see on Amazon, and they just change so much the way the, the big publishers will get on a trend, and then they'll skip to another trend, so I wanted to covers that would be timeless. Um, right. They're not trendy, they're, they're very elegant, they're very clean. Um, I think Prudence is a very elegant woman. Deep down, she's a little rough around the edges, but she's she's elegant. And I just wanted these books to depict who she was and, well, it, and, and who she is as a character. Yeah. So thank you for asking me about that. I really do love it. So. My pleasure. Now, how long did it take for you to write the moon? Um, the, okay, so the, this book did... No, it took me a year which was fast because the first book took me about three years to write. Um, more I write, the more I understand what I have to do. Um, and I, I call the, for, I'm a, I mentioned this to you earlier, I'm a pantser, so I don't plot. I just write. Um, and then I, I just get the vomit draft out, just get it out. That's the way the first draft has to be. It's terrible. You would, if you died the day that you finished writing it and somebody read it, you, I mean, you die all over again. Like, you just never want anyone to see that draft. But it has to happen so that you can figure out where you're going with the book. Um, and I originally, I, I lost a lot of sleep over whether or not Prudence was going to fall in love with someone in this book. And I did not want, and a lot of my readers wanted her to fall in love with Alistair, the person she kissed in rehab. And I lost a lot of sleep over it and what I was going to do. And I went back and forth and vacillated. But I think once I decided how I was going to unfold that and what I was going to do and made my decision, I just turned out the next draft. Like, I just was like, okay, here we go. And my agent told me that under no circumstances can Prudence have a relationship with her therapist in this book. So... The person she has a relationship with in this, in this book is herself and her son and trying to mend the broken relationship with her son um, from the damage that her addiction has caused him. So, um, and then obviously a lot of things happen with her friendship with Lily. And there is one slight, one sexual scene. I won't tell you who she has sex with, but she regrets it. <laughs> she regrets it. So... Um, yeah. Now, between uh, the moon and the sky, which character or part of the novel was more challenging and uh, harder for you to write? Um, I had a amazing mother. I mean, amazing. And I had, I very much struggled with writing the mother as a bad character in a dress the color of the sky because for some reason I felt like I was betraying my mother who's, who's no longer here and she's and I dedicated the book to her and she was such a great mom and I just never wanted people to think oh that was what my mom was like because it wasn't I had just such a great mom but I needed to have Prudence's mom 
not there for her so that you could see the damage that was happening to her um, by her stepfather. So, so there was, that was very, very hard for me. The other thing that was really hard for me with this book, the new book, um, was, like I said, deciding whether or not Prudence was going to have a relationship with someone. And then I had to let one of the addicts that I bring to Los Angeles, one of the, one of the characters from the first book, I bring several of them to Los Angeles. Um, and his wheels just come off the bus. Like he, because not every rehab story ends up happy. A lot of people don't make it. If you don't do the work and you don't go to the meetings and you don't keep on the path, you're going to relapse. So I didn't really want to have that ugliness in the book, but I needed to have it because the reality is people don't make it. And we do have a serious addiction problem in our country. And I had to realistically say that, that if, and I felt like I would be betraying um, the 12 step program and how people follow it or don't follow it. And what happens if you don't, it's just, it's, you're not going to make it. You can't white knuckle through. So I, I, it was difficult. And I turned that around. I think on draft three, I had originally had him making it and things going really well. And then I was like, Oh no, no, no. This guy's got to just go down the rabbit hole and it's bad. And it starts with these little lies. Little right. tiny lies, the lies that make you sick, the secrets that make you sick, and, and denial, and, and thinking that he's different from everyone else, his unique story, and he's not like the other addicts. You know, I think I can drink a little and not do cocaine. Just all these little lies that, you know, addicts tell themselves. So, um, and it's very sad when he does go down the bad path, but then everybody's there to lift him back up, get him back on his feet, and get him back into treatment. So, I don't want to give a lot of spoilers, but it was hard to write. My dad was a cocaine addict, and I, I remember writing a scene when he goes really deep into it, the drugs one night, and I was shaking because it brings back so much from my experiences with my, my father and seeing him doing drugs. And um, so it was it's just, it, but it, I'm, I'm glad I did it because I think it makes it not only makes the story better, but it, it it's it's the way it's the way things happen. Right. Yeah. Some people that aren't you know that, that just don't make it, and it's kind of sad. But I do give a little hope because he finally says I can't make it by myself. So everybody's like, we want to help you. So it's good. Yeah. Right now, what has been a revolution in this um, journey of your writing from your uh, debut novel, The Sky, to the sequel? Has there, has there been um, any revolution? Um, a revolution inside me or with... Yeah, for, 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 you, you, as, for you as a writer. For you as a writer. Um, I, I, I have, my editor, I have the same editor, and my editor um, called me after I sent him the draft, the final draft, and I had not read it, no, no versions of it. And I was really nervous because he's also my publisher. And I waited and I waited and then I got a text message and he said, this is, this is incredible. And it's, and he said, your writing has evolved so much. I just see just such a, and he said, it's really, it's just really great to see it, to see you growing as a writer. And, um, it, it, it that was just for me, it's like your dad giving you a really nice compliment, you know, you just, that you, that you, that they're proud of you or something. It just was a very, it was really great to hear from him. Um, also, my agent um, had told me the same thing, that my writing has really evolved and has gotten just tighter and better and, and the story's just cleaner and has more um, just compelling storylines and the characters are, are flushed out more just the little things that happen as you write more it's like a muscle you just have to do it every day and you have to keep practicing and you will get better so absolutely. it's just fun when other people tell you yeah you're getting better <laughs> absolutely and i think that's that's also the beauty with writing isn't it the, the more you write the better you are going to get at uh, get yeah, at it. yeah 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 definitely um, all right it's fun no. 
what is, what is your writing process like? Uh, do you think of the plot first or do you work on the characters and other details and then you develop that into a plot? How, how do you go about it? Um, I am a pantser, so I just write and I write and write and write and um, I, I take walks. When I walk, I, I think about things and the story and I'll write a note and I have to do this, I have to do that. And I keep pads and papers in my car, just writing things down because I'll think of something, but I don't plot before I write. Um, I, I, I would find that very binding and very um, uh, squelching to my creativity. So um, I would say in my head, I have a lot of ideas of how it's going to go and where I'm going to go with it. Um, but I don't really know until I start writing exactly where the characters are going to take me. I let them sort of guide me. Um, and the very ending always comes to me somehow. I can tie it all up with the bow and yet leave a little bit hanging where you're like, I want to know what's going to happen next. Right. <laughs> when it happens, feeling that... <laughs> Um, I'm an afternoon writer, which I know is not ideal. Most people that are super creative and very good writers, right? Crack it on in the morning, but my creative energy just spurts in the afternoon. And I just, I, um, typically from two o'clock to five thirty, six o'clock, I write and work on my writing. So, um, that's my most creative time. And, um, I, I, I do a sales job and I do that in the mornings and, um, I talk to a lot of characters on the phone, so I get the I get to sort of like interact with people, and I get some ideas, write some notes down when I'm talking to people, or a certain accent, or how they say something, and it's good for my for my writing. So yeah, right. Now, who are the writers uh, that inspired you? Oh, um, oh well, Ernest Hemingway, of course. Um, I would say. Judy Bloom early on when I was uh -huh. really young. I just loved her books and she kind of got me in in love with and then Daniel Steele, you know, my in my late teens and twenties. Um right. and um I I like Sydney Sheldon. Um I love the grapes of wrath and, and a lot of the classics. Um and Don Stein, back just going, reading the classics, going back to the classics of Mice and Men. Um, just those books are very moving to me. But if I was going to just say really one book that had a very deep impact on me, and I'd say made me realize that I wanted to write, it was um, Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt. And it's um, it was his memoir. He, he passed away, which I thought was really sad because I think he's. He just, just told the most incredible story, and, and it really made me realize the strength of, of resilience of the human spirit. And he was able to write these gnarliest things that happened in his childhood in just such an incredibly light, positive manner. And you just, I don't know, I, I don't know if, it, I, I do think when you read a book, where you are in your life can really have an effect on how the book makes you feel. But the time I was pregnant, um, and I, 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 I think I was realizing that I was in a very bad marriage, and my brother, I was with my brother, and he was watching the other two kids, and I would just read, and nap, and this book just, it just had such a moving effect on me. Um, they like Dominic Dunn. I think he's a great writer. Um, I like the way he tells the story. I mean. I'm the gam, but I'm all over the place with, with reading. I and mean, right now I typically try to read Reese's book club picks and Oprah's book club picks. Um, and I loved House of Sand and Fog. I mean, there's just so many. I, I would just sit here and just say it all day long. But I just, a lot of, I love books about strife and overcoming and um, human spirit and just people that struggle. and rise above i don't know why but i'm drawn to those kinds of books so a little bit depressing but i love it yeah that's the, that's quite a range and uh, quite a few books that you uh, <laughs> <listed out. laughs> thank you for that <laughs>
<laughs> you you had several several awards to your credit. You have this Pedit Will New Apple Reader's Favorite and Book Excellence Awards. Mm-hmm. Now, which of these came as a no surprise for you? One that you felt you were you're sure of bagging. Um, I didn't. I wasn't sure of anything. I'd say the <laughs> biggest surprise for me was when we won an Ippy, which my publisher was very happy about. That's the Inter- Independent Publishing um, Award. And I didn't even know he had submitted the book and, and um, Address the Color of the Sky got gold. And I, I was competing in a very difficult genre, you know, women's fiction. And um, taking a gold against books all over that are independently published in a very difficult category, um, I was really excited about. Um, but I, I'd say Reader's Favorite, when I got a bronze in women's fiction, that was also because they get thousands and thousands of entries. And I did not think I was going to even come close. Um, and when I got a bronze, and again, a very tough category, I was like, yay! And it's just, for me, I don't think readers care about book awards. They just don't. It was a validation to me that I can write. And okay. when I put my work up against other writers, I can compete. And that was a huge validation personally that I should keep writing. And that little nudge that I needed to someone in a way to acknowledge that I had a little bit of a talent, that I could do something that uh, I could tell a story in a way that was compelling. And that was huge for me. Now, exciting. what are your other interests apart from uh, apart from uh, writing? Um, I I exercise every day. Um, I'm very active as far as because um, it helps my mental health. And you're sitting a lot when you're writing. You're sitting a lot of my other jobs, so I try to take a walk, get on my spin bike, do plotties. Um, I like to ski when I when it's winter time and I can get the time off. Um, I love spending time with my three sons. They're leading their own lives now, but they're just the, the greatest guys, and I just can't even imagine any hanging out with anyone. I just love hanging out with them, and I just think they're just so awesome. And I love when they're all in the house, and a lot of banter. Um, music's very big, so my son, one of my boys, is in a band, and I would before COVID, I was always in the front row whenever he was playing, and just a super fan, embarrassing mom, you know. Um, just listening to them play music is really exciting. Um, hanging out with my friends. I'm a big foodie. I love um, buying new restaurants and supporting restaurants and chefs in LA. Um, we have a really good food scene here. Food trucks, awesome food trucks. Um, just doing LA kind of things, going to the beach and watching the sunset and oh hi Lily my cat's named Lily can you figure out why <laughs> my cat's right next to me over here yeah hi Lily this is Lily named oh, after right. the character in my book <laughs> <laughs> right. so um so at any rate yeah I just I I keep active but I I'm actually um for the most part I do keep to myself as far as um I don't have a huge social schedule but like last night I went out to dinner with a bunch of friends and it was super fun I'm always really energized when I get to hang out with my friends because they get me out of my little shell my writing world um so I try to make plans with friends to to do that and I love fashion of course so anytime I can get out and put on an outfit (laughs) get out of my sweatpants (laughs) fair enough Fair enough. Now, uh, what would your advice be to new novelists um, like me, for example, to get quick and genuine reviews for their books? Um, well, I, I first of all, congratulations on your book. And <laughs> I, 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 anybody that get, can write a book is a huge accomplishment. It's a very big accomplishment. So a lot of people say, I want to write a book. I started writing a book, but they never finish it. It's very scary to put your work out to the world for everyone to critique and tell. Um, and, and you just, you never know. You're so close to it. You don't really know if it's good or not or how other people are going to think it's coming across or what they'll like the characters or not. But 
it's just a very big deal. And I would just say, keep writing and also don't, don't give up. Um, keep sharing your books, keep sharing your work, um, learn about Amazon and, and how you can get ranked in Amazon. Um, if you publish indie and promote your books on social media, just keep hustling because nobody's going to work as hard as you will to get your work out there. So you have to just do it. Um, and, and it's a lot and it's not that fun sometimes, but marketing is a huge part of the different hats that writers have to wear um, to get your book out there and try to get a lot of reviews, encourage people to write reviews, give away books if you have to, um, so that you can get reviews because reviews are very helpful um, with how people are going to look at and they see your book on Amazon and if they see good reviews, they might give, give them a little bit more of a nudge to purchase it. So. Um, I just am talking about my books all the time. People are so sick of it. <laughs> I just have people on the street. Oh, do you like to read? I'll see someone at the car wash. What are you reading? I'm a novelist. You know, so just keep promoting your work. Don't, don't be afraid. You know, you wrote a book, so um, may as well try and get people to read it. Absolutely. Also yeah. keep writing. Set a goal for yourself for your next book. Write yourself a goal. I'm going to have another book written by this date. One year. Give yourself one year. Right. You know, do National do national Novel Writing Month is um, a great motivator. I always do it in November. Um, and there's a great team of uh, writers in LA, and we all get together and write in November, and it's super fun. Um, try to join a writing group and things like that. Just think it's really good to have camaraderie with writing. Right. Fair enough. Thank you so much for your time and it was lovely interacting thank with you. you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much for having me and I'm, I'm very grateful and you'll have to send me your address. I'm going to try and get a book to you. See if we can get it absolutely. to be absolutely. actually be delivered. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And thank all the best so from uh, the writer talks to, to you on your uh, new sequel that's going to be published on uh, October 30th. Address the yes. moon. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. Thank Bye. you, Jennifer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>